Right, so... It, <laughs> what? It, it's, a, it's a new pod, isn't it? Which it's a new pod? pod? What yeah. are we, pod seven? I think we are. Now, you see, if pod seven were actually a real pod in Thunderbird 2, I think yes. it might be some gigantic sort of excavating machine with some sort of massive grappling hook. That's very much how I'm seeing this podcast. <laughs> are you with me? Lumbering. Uh, uh, oversized. Is that right. what you mean? Should we do pod seven? Uh, yeah, I guess. Isn't there someone someone to intro it for us? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's going well so far, isn't it? <laughs> We've got a very special guest to introduce Pod 7 for us. Shall I introduce him? Well, it- I think he introduced himself, actually. <laughs> well, well, I don't. <laughs> Parker, c- come and say a few words. Hello, partners. You are listening to the Jerry Henderson podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Right, here we are. I can't believe we got Parker to introduce Pod 7. What Isn't that an exciting? Absolute coup. That's amazing. Parker, of all people. I know. Well, he's introduced, introduced himself. Who are you? Well, um, you know, Jamie, very well that my name is Richard James. Is it? But I do appreciate there are many people who are listening who might not know me from Adam. So, indeed, my name is Richard James. Uh, I'm an actor and uh, playwright and um, friend to um, Jamie, have been for many years now. Uh, I first met Jamie in the corridors of Pinewood Studios when I was playing uh, Officer Orin in Jerry Anderson's Space Precinct. So there's my um, Jerry Anderson connection. And then... Uh, more recently, I played Jeremy Vile in the uh, Terrorhawks audio series um, produced by Big Finish and uh, and Jamie himself. That's me. It is you. Thanks That's for that. It, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you I'm, are? I'm Jamie Anderson, uh, son of Jerry Anderson, uh, uh, Baldy, uh, oh. producer, writer, director ish. Um, ish? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm. Dab- dabbling. Well, I'm counting uh, on you to provide me gainful employment for the rest of my career, so uh, ish. Oh, all right, I'm working on it. I'm doing my very best. <laughs> now, of course, you can find us on Twitter. I am Richard N. James, and uh, Jamie is uh, I'm Jamie Anderson. I am Jamie Anderson. Uh, See, Nens- you have to explain that message. every time. Uh, you have to explain that every time, and I course. thought it would be really simple and clever to be I'm Jamie Anderson on Twitter. Yes, but but you it's can't not, have the apostrophe, can you? Anyway, sorry. Do you now, Lenscat got in touch with us via Twitter uh, after our last uh, um, uh, podcast and said, I can highly recommend the Jerry Anderson podcast. It has a great intro tune. Just that, though. <laughs> That's it. That's as good as it gets. And after we've had the, that bit, so... After the tune, yeah, you put, might as well switch off now. <laughs> Thanks, Lenscap. Now, of course, you can get in touch with us uh, whenever you want. You can email us with your comments and thoughts and questions to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll do the very best we can to uh, respond. Uh, what should people do if they wanted to, um, you know, share this podcast with their friends, Jamie? Well, I mean, they can share the links on their social media mm-hmm. or tell people about it in person, mm. text them, send mm. them a letter, write mm. them a postcard. Very old school. There's a there's a share feature in most podcast apps where, you, you know, that little square with the arrow pointing out of the top of it, which yeah. is a, some, some sort of share thing. But do share it because, you know... A friend yeah. of yours might thank you. But well, they might. So. Yeah, they might. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and of course you can subscribe and you can rate us on iTunes and uh, various other platforms. And please do leave a review. It's great to see uh, your comments. Uh, most of them are quite positive. Uh, all, all of them aren't, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, I think we've got something like 90 odd percent of our things are five star and a few are four star so that's amazing fantastic that's great so yes do subscribe and that way you will get a notification every week as every new podcast drops and uh, don't forget to rate and review drops to you using down with the kids terms again 
Uh, yeah, I suppose a bit weird. Anyway, what's coming up, Richard? Well, we've got all the usual great stuff, of course. Uh, we've got some uh, news from the Jerry Anderson universe. We've got uh, listener emails, comments and questions. And, of course, we've got the amazing Chris Dale with another episode of his randomizer. Uh, that's when Chris is sat down, tied to a chair and forced to watch a random episode from the Jerry Anderson universe and comment as he watches. Great fun. What will it be this week? We will. We don't know. It's random. That's the whole point. Exactly. Yeah. That is the point of it. That's right. And even though, Jamie, you forgot to mention this pod's interviewee last time, I think from the uh, introduction we just had that we might just guess that it's... Yeah, I've probably guessed it's David Graham. It is. Yes, David Graham, the, the legendary David Graham. Who has recently celebrated a birthday. He's 93 years old. Amazing. Uh, still working, still doing Peppa Pig and still doing his classic voices, but best known in the Anderson universe for the voices of Gramps in Four Feather Falls... Um, Parker and Gordon Tracy and Brains yeah. in Thunderbirds, loads and loads of other guest characters. Yeah. He, I mean, uh, Matthew Matic in Fire Black Cell 5. Yeah. Yeah, he just keeps coming up and he's amazing. Wait, and and where, really did you, where did you interview uh, Where did you interview David? I interviewed him in his very lovely flat in London town. Perfect. It was great. Now, I must apologise in advance. There was a technical issue. Well, that, the interview. What a surprise. I know it was really sad, actually. But it, so we we had this lovely, lovely chat about families and um, uh, stuff, which I, I will fill in in the interview itself. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's about seven minutes of interview up, up front which are missing, so I have to I'm going to have to kind of fill in from memory. Great shame. Yeah. Uh, but we, it was sort of stuff we couldn't just repeat. No. Uh, so apologies, things? everyone. But there there's still a good sort of forty minutes of David Graham. Yeah, for, to enjoy. Great. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, that's you know, that's Jerry Anderson royalty right there, isn't it? And everyone I who ever met, I don't think I've ever met David myself, but everyone I know who's met him have said what a lovely gentleman he is. Always very happy to listen and talk, and uh, really enjoys being part of the uh, the Jerry Anderson world, which is lovely. Yeah. Well, he he said it's you know he owes most of his career mm. to being involved with Anderson stuff. So mm. and he, and a lovely chap he is. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Well, there we I go. Mean, from David Graham coming up. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it's nice to finally have a professional to work with. Uh, so, uh... Oh, thanks, Richard. <laughs> Hi, Gordon Tracy speaking. It's time for the Jerry Anderson News. Right. There you go. Uh, See, that's how it should be done, Jamie. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't realise I was doing such a rubbish job. Listen but... and learn. Hmm? Okay, I'll um, I'll listen to the podcast again later. <laughs> what news do we have, Jamie? Stop the podcast! <laughs> right, so after Richard and I recorded this episode, uh, I was informed of some very good news, and that news is... The name's Brogan. Lieutenant Brogan. For 20 years, I was with the NYPD. Now, well, let's just say I've transferred to another precinct. But Space Precinct, the complete DVD collection, is coming this November from Network Distributing. Uh, more details will be on the Jerry Anderson website, but it's the first time that the UK will have had a complete collection of Space Precinct. I'm very excited about it. We're putting in uh, a lot of extras as much as we can, a load of new photos, uh, some uh, behind the scenes tests, all sorts of stuff. But yes, for the first time, Space Precinct will, av will be available as a complete collection on DVD. And uh, I'm very excited about it. And Rich will be very upset that he, he didn't get to comment on this straight away. So now back to the original Pod 7. Well, there is news, which is nice, isn't there? Mm. Um, to those who enjoyed Beyond Anderson episodes one and two, which are part of our mini YouTube series exploring the wider careers of famous Anderson names from the Jerry Anderson universe, like uh, Ed Bishop and Denise Breyer, mm -hmm. there are two more episodes on the way. Great. Featuring Great. Shane Rimmer and Cy Grant. Oh, how interesting. So lots of you will know Shane Rimmer, voice of Scott Tracy. Um, maybe not as many will know Cy, who was the voice of Lieutenant Green in uh, Captain Scarlet. Mm -hmm. But Cy had a really, really interesting career uh, and a life of activism mm. outside of uh, the theatre, TV and, and film. So, yeah, a really interesting one coming up. Mm. 
A um, couple of bits of Captain Scarlet news leading neatly on from Cy Grant. Yes, lovely. What's that then? Both limited edition bits of news. Ooh. So you may wish to rush off to the Jerry Anderson store at shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. Mm-hmm. First up, uh, we may have discussed this before, but Network have released uh, the fourth volume of Classic Captain Scarlet in high definition, the Blu-ray. And as part of that release, it's a brand new, beautiful box set featuring art cards and a poster and a comic, and it's a really, really lovely set. There are only 1,250 worldwide. Uh, Network had the first 1,000 available. They are pretty much sold out and may well be sold out by the time this goes out. Crumbs. But we have secured the last 250 copies of this exclusive box set. Oh, so if you want to grab it, go to the Jerry Anderson store and, uh, yeah, I think they're going to fly pretty quick. Oh, of course they will. Yeah. 25 quid or something right, for the right. for this beautiful box set, including right. volume four of the Blu-ray. Yeah. So go grab it. Lovely. Uh, further news on Captain Scarlet's limited edition things. Mm-hmm. The Captain Scarlet replica pistol. Oh, God, I want one of those. What is one? available. Yeah. Well, uh, again, at the time of recording... There are only 350 available worldwide. Uh, a couple in a, in, a, in a variety of colours. We did have a limited edition of uh, Captain Oka's pistol and Captain Magenta's. They've both sold out already. Mm. Yes. So the only ones we've got left are Scarlet, White, Green and Blue. Uh, oh, and Captain Black as well. So you might want to grab those yeah. as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Where can we find these, Jamie? On the Jerry Anderson store, shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. Yeah, I mean, they really are selling like hotcakes, so I would advise, just as soon as you've listened to this podcast, have a yeah, visit to the, the shop and uh, pick one or two up. <laughs> I would. They are, they are really, really lovely yes, items, and uh, anyone who got the uh, Thunderbirds ray gun last year will confirm how lovely they are. Anyway, don't miss out. We'd hate you too. Great. Yeah, that's lovely. And uh, now, listeners to our last podcast might remember the Fab Walls uh, offer. Now, is that still still current and running? Uh, it certainly is. And what's that yeah. all about? So if you go on the Jerry Anson store and you want to buy any of our lovely wall adornments, better known as posters, yeah. probably, yeah. Um, just put in the code FABWALLS at checkout, F-A-B-W-A-L-L-S, all in capitals, and you'll get 40% off of your posters. Mm. Uh, quite a few of them have had their prices reduced recently as well. So mm. um, amazing. That'll be, it'll be even cheaper, obviously. Yeah, yeah. That's how discounts work, isn't it? Yeah, and they are beautiful, aren't they? They are beautiful indeed, and include Captain Scarlet if you really want to top up your yeah. Captain Scarletness. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Richard, that's kind of enough of the newsy stuff. Is it? Yeah. So, have you got any news from your life? Any news from my life? Well, again, I'm still on tour. I've been on in uh, in Aylesbury this week, which has been rather nice. I've been able to commute because I live quite nearby, uh, and there I met um, as part of my ongoing quest to meet Jerry Anderson fans around the country. There I met uh, Sebastian Bird and Hannah Padley, who came along to see the show and met me afterwards uh, at stage door. And Seb was wearing his Space Precinct T-shirt, of course. Excellent. Which must have excited much comment in the audience as you sat and watched the show. Um, and I also I bumped into an old friend it. of mine called uh, Timmy Mallet, who you might be uh, familiar with. Oh, I love Timmy Mallet. Timmy Mallet, uh, legendary entertainer, children's TV broadcaster, uh, lives quite nearby here. And, and actually, he wanted to share a memory that he had of, uh, of meeting Jerry. Excellent. Uh, so and he, he got said, that uh, memory. So he dropped me an email and he said, uh, hi, Richard, Jerry Anderson was a real gent. Well, that plainly doesn't run in the family, does it? Uh, he said, I met him once on a TV show we did. Uh, my memory was checking into a hotel together and me asking for a ground floor room. I don't like being upstairs either, he said. And I explained that I was giving up lifts for Lent. Timmy doesn't record quite what your dad's response was to that rather lame joke. It was probably the same as mine, which is a slightly <laughs> blank stare and a yeah. polite chuckle. <laughs> and he said, we then talked about the King's Arms and Parker being based on the landlord, he says here. Cheers. And that's from Timmy Mallet. Yes, that's the, the famous story, of course. I think it was the wine which, waiter. It wasn't the it? landlord. It was the wine waiter. And yeah. David does very briefly cover it in our interview, although Great. I did say at the start, everyone's heard it before. Yes. Let's not do too much on it. Exactly. No, that's right. But, it, you know, it's always a story worth retelling, especially when it comes from, uh, from the great Timmy Mallet himself. Very true. Well, thanks for that contribution, Timmy. Bless you. Yeah, that's nice. And, of course, you can follow Timmy on Twitter, at Timmy Mallet. 
Oh, there yeah. you go. Quite simple. Give him, give him a tweet. Yeah, why not? That's right. Uh, well, yeah. That's all the news, isn't it? It is. Should we um, go on to the next bit? Then? Well, yeah. Should we do some listener emails, Jamie? Uh, probably. Yeah, well, now before I... you, yeah, before you introduce the uh, listener emails, I've got someone who I think is much more qualified to do it. Uh, hi, it, it's uh, b- b- brain speaking. Uh, I just want to tell you that it's a, a, a time for listeners' e- emails. Richard, it does feel a little bit like you're trying to replace me doing these section announcements. Well, <laughs> Jamie, how, how could we possibly do that? <clears throat> anyway, uh, so first up, <clears throat> we had an email from Simon Jeffries moving swiftly along. Uh, Simon says, uh, hello, Jamie and Richard. Mm, Thank yeah, you, Simon. Got that right again. Yeah, uh, he's loving the podcast. He said, I literally found it by random. Well, how on earth did that happen? We must have searched or something or yeah. seen it in a... Maybe seen it in the top TV and film charts. Ah, Jamie, you might have which, done. Which we've slipped down a bit now. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Always worth a mention. Uh, so uh, yeah, Simon says, um, yeah, I grew up in the late 70s and 80s watching the many shows from the Jerry Anderson universe. It's a whippersnapper there if you grew up in the 70s and 80s. Crikey. Uh, obviously, Thunderbirds was my first big memory growing up, but I've recently discovered my love for Space 1999 and UFO. I do have a small question, he says. Did you or your father ever come across a Japanese puppet show called Starfleet? It was shown on ITV in the early 80s. At the time, I honestly thought it was a Jerry Anderson production. I know it wasn't. Uh, And I could have sworn there was a rumour that Anderson Productions at the time were thinking of joint production for Series 2. Or was that wishful thinking? What do we think? Starfleet. Uh, Yeah, I know know Starfleet because um, uh, Denise Breyer, who played Zelda in Terrorhawks, also played... Commander Makara in Starfleet. Okay. Uh, and th- I think a lot of people at the time thought it might have been a new Anderson production. Um, and Dad was at the time probably getting ready for Terrorhawks, so he was probably quite keen to dispel that mm. myth. I see. So, yeah, he was aware, he was already working on Terrorhawks at the time. I see. Um, but it was nothing to do with that. I don't think there was ever any plan for any kind of co production because it was a Japanese series. And, yeah. Uh, there wasn't that sort of engagement. Yeah. How interesting. I don't remember Starfleet. 1980s? A little bit of it on, um, on, on YouTube. YouTube yeah. I was it's watching quite cute. Like Battle of the Planets in the 80s. Do you remember Battle of the Planets? I don't. Of course you don't. don't. I've heard of it, but yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. Uh, he also aware. says, you've asked about Anderson-based cosplays, and I've done Tiger Einstein and Space 1999 Moonbase member, and he sent us some pictures, so maybe we could uh, show them on the next Fab Live, perhaps. Yeah, and I'm also going to include them in the show notes for this Great. episode of the podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk forward slash podcast forward slash pod seven. Oh, wow. Excellent. Fantastic. They'll be there. Great. For those of you that don't know, Fab Live is our mm, just about monthly uh, Facebook live broadcast that Jamie and I do, uh, whereby it's much more sort of engaging, really, and that you can actually get engaged. I don't mean it's more interesting. I just mean that uh, we can include your comments live as you watch, which is which is great fun. Uh, and finally, I have another tweet as well from Craig Walker, who said he's still very much enjoying the Jerry Anderson podcast. Having expected to start hating them already. <laughs> That's right. Uh, he said, it's great to hear the passion from Lee Sullivan and from Sophie Aldred in their interviews. Uh, keep the pods coming. So, yes, you can listen to all these uh, past podcasts and uh, hear previous interviews uh, from uh, Lee Sullivan, uh, Sophia Miles, Sophie Aldred, uh, Gary Newman. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And more. And more to come. Exactly. Um, I've got an email. Lovely. From Big Al. Oh, yes. Big Al says, loving your podcasts nice. with a big smiley face. Nice. I've been a massive fan of all things Jerry Anderson since the early 90s BBC repeats of Thunderbirds along with episodes of Doctor Who. And it's great to hear that the legend lives on with the DVDs, audios and even new projects like Thunderbirds 1965, Gemini Force One and Q Fanfare. Firestorm. Lovely. Talking of audios, I'd like to say how much I'm enjoying Jamie's directing work at Big Finish. Not Aww. just the excellent Terrorhawks and Captain Scarlet sets, but also several Doctor Whos. Uh, Cold Fusion and The Hour of the Sidemen in particular are the two of the best audios in the whole Who range. Oh, quite right. Looking forward to the next podcast. Big Al, sent from my big rat, it says. <laughs> Lovely. So there you go. Isn't that nice? Yeah, Thank you very, very nice. much, Thanks, Al. That's very good, That's, isn't it? That is lovely. Yeah. Uh, and yes, if you haven't tried them, you can get free sample episodes of the Big Finish Terrorhawks and Captain Scarlet mm. audios from mm. bigfinish.com. So do yeah. pop, pop along there and get some freebies. Great. Very nice. Um, well, I have a, a, an email here from Thomas Woodbridge, 
Uh, Thomas says, Dear Jamie and Richard, and he puts in a brackets alphabetical order. Well, that's no excuse. <laughs> Uh, I've been <laughs> I've been a fan of Jerry Anderson's shows for longer than I can remember. My father, also a fan, was born in 1960 and thus grew up during the original runs of the series. When I eventually when I eventually came along, he made sure I didn't miss out. And while other kids my age were watching Dragon Ball cartoons, no idea what they are, I became obsessed with the worlds of Super Mario Nation. I was fascinated by the machines, and some of my earlier memories involved being ecstatic to have received the big toys from Vivid Imaginations which must have been released in the early 2000s. There must be some home video somewhere of the exploits of International Rescue saving a Lego boat from catastrophe on the living room carpet, the Thunderbird scene playing off the telly in the background. I still have all of the toys and I never even lost any of the SPV's firing missiles. Impressive. Yeah, I'm sure we all remember playing with those toys. And yes, there probably are quite a few uh, home videos up and down the country of people playing with their Thunderbirds, Lego and toys and so on. Amazing. Uh, he said, I realise that for many Jerry Anderson fans, Thunderbirds evokes the strongest feelings of nostalgia, and this is likely because of its generally warmer tone. But in my opinion, the finest Anderson show is Captain Scarlet. The models, sets and effects are simply phenomenal, and the increase in realism from Thunderbirds drew me into the fantastic world even more. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, this is a debate that yeah. Jerry Anderson fans very often have amongst themselves. And I do think there's maybe a 50-50 split yeah, uh, between uh, you know those who think Thunderbirds is the peak and those who think yeah. Captain Scarlet is absolutely. Uh, I'm also a massive fan, says Thomas, of the sweeping themes and jazzy tunes written by Barry Gray, absolutely, whose work was so influential in making the shows so cinematic. I would love to know why there are two versions of the Scarlet credits theme with and without lyrics. Hmm. It just decided too late to you know put the song uh, on i think okay. i don't I, yeah it's yeah not, it's not a very exciting reason so yeah sure <laughs> uh it's interesting though you often you know it's rather like what would uh they very often say the beatles weren't the beatles until ringo Starr came along and you could perhaps there's a case to be made about jerry anderson and, and barry gray providing the music i mean that's a big part of the jerry anderson uh yeah story isn't it are you saying jerry anderson wasn't jerry anderson until barry gray came along <laughs> well barry gray wasn't barry gray until jerry anderson came along <laughs> or both <laughs> That's up for you to decide. Thomas says, I'm currently at university studying aerospace engineering, so obviously Jerry Anderson has had no effect at all on my life choices. Excellent. That's really nice, isn't it? Uh, many thanks to both of you and for your efforts in keeping the spirit alive, Jamie. I'm sure your father would be proud of your work bringing classic television to new generations of fans. I can personally attest that when I was a child, I never thought the show seemed dated and I never noticed the strings. It's a testament to the vision of all those involved that 50 odd years later, for the most part, the shows still seem as futuristic as ever. There's something somehow timelessly modern about the worlds that Jerry created. Yours sincerely, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Isn't that lovely? Nice. That yeah, lovely lovely. email. Thank yeah, you, Thomas. That's great. Yeah, I mean, that covered all sorts of things. We, we were asking previously about uh, people that, who might have been inspired by Jerry's work in their choice of career or, or in their hobbies even. I know lots of you out there do lots of... Uh, Wonderful videos and make your own vehicles and cosplay and so on. And we love to hear about it. Um, got another tweet for you as well, Jamie, if you're interested. Another tweet? Yeah, Joshua Goodness Gerald Butler me. says he just binge listened to the first five pods of the Jerry Anderson podcast. And he absolutely thing. loved them. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, that's lucky, isn't it? It is. Uh, the interview with Sophia Miles was absolutely incredible. And as an 18-year-old who looks at the 2005 film through rose-tinted spectacles, it was a joy to listen to her. Nice. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, that's sort of what we wanted to achieve, yeah. actually, is exactly. to, that's you right. know, open of... open things up to those who actually did enjoy that film. Yeah, yeah, quite right, too. So uh, thank you, Joshua, for that. Uh, now, I do have a question for you, for you, Jamie. This is from Mark Wilson. Uh, now, he again says, Hi, guys, I came across this podcast by chance. I, I just don't understand how that might happen. Well, I mean, just I think it is just flicking through the charts, the categories, all that sort of yeah. stuff, and go, hang on, yeah, is that Thunderbird two? Or That's a Jerry Anderson podcast. True. Yeah, yeah, it is a great image as well on the uh, the old iTunes. Uh, it is. Thank you, Chris Thompson, uh, for that design. Yes, he says, thank God I did. As a lifelong fan of Jerry Anderson's work, I've got to say, this is a fantastic podcast. Well, bless him. Yeah, I'd stop listening now if I were you. Because it ain't going to get any better. Uh, yeah, downhill I, from here, Mark. <laughs> I do have a question for you. Do you, Jamie, still possess or know who possesses all the original puppets and crafts used on the shows? I can imagine they're quite valuable now, sent from Mark. So, firstly, Jamie, do you still have any of the original puppets or crafts, or do you know where they are? Uh, well, Mark, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> we had I had Penelope and Parker in my wardrobe when I was a kid, hanging in a plastic bin bag. 
uh, which Dad auctioned off, I think, in 1998, maybe, somewhere around then. Mm. The vast majority of the craft and puppets and sets all ended up in landfill yes. and around Slough, because at the time, there wasn't really this kind of cult attitude around TV. No. They never thought it would be still going 50 years on. No. So it was just, well, that's done. We've got to make space. So uh, let's chuck them in, in the skip. Yeah. Um, a lot Good of stuff enough. was salvaged from the skip. A lot of people who worked on the show did take puppets home. Uh, Mary Turner, one of the puppeteers, still has a few. Christine Glanville, who died sadly, um, gosh, quite a, lot, a long time ago mm. now. She bequeathed her collection to the uh, Victorian Albert Museum. But unfortunately, at the moment, all of those puppets are in storage. Peter Jackson, director of Lord of the Rings, has the largest private collection of puppets and vehicles from Thunderbirds, I think, in the world. Wow. Um, and the majority of others are in private collections all over the place. But I think the, the, the vast majority of originals ended up in landfill. Yeah, that's criminal, isn't it? What a shame. But as you it say, they didn't think sad. about it. Didn't think we'd be all, all so interested in it 50 years later, did they? No, exactly. Home entertainment didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, and they, you know, as far as they were concerned, they were being driven by Lou Grade, really, whose attitude was, I need something new every year or two. Yeah. So if, if that's the kind of top down feeling, we yeah. need something new, what's the point of hanging on to all this stuff? Yeah. That's what right. What a shame, though. There we are. Uh, interesting hearing you mention Christine Glanville there, who I think worked with Jerry way back in the early, early days. She did. Um, she worked from Twizzle mm. back in 57. And I uh, remember her, of course, on the studio floor for uh, for Space Precinct, where she uh, did lots of animatronic operating. For, she did uh, a lot of operating of Podley's face, did. didn't she? Yeah. I think that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, Jerry was really quite, uh, well, loyal, but, you know, he liked to use people that he knew would get the job done and that, that he liked and got on with. Yeah. He liked to keep the, the sort of Anderson family together where mm. possible. Of course, he never used me again, but... Uh, <clears throat> Anyway. Well, Richard, yeah. come on, I have though, haven't I? I've used you. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's, that's the same thing, sort of. <laughs> that's nice. Um, got another tweet here. Uh, James Pilson Wood said he was listening to Pod 5 while giving blood. <laughs> right. So uh, I thought, well, that would be interesting to know. Where's the strangest place you've listened to one of our <laughs> Jerry Anderson podcasts? <laughs> We'd really like to know. So do drop the strangest place you've ever listened to one of our podcasts to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll read it out next time. Lots of people I know listen there on the commute in their cars on the way to work and so on and on the tube and so on. So that's all very good. But where's the strangest place you've listened? Uh, if you have any other questions, comments or thoughts that you'd like us to read out in pod eight, uh, you can drop them to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk uh, and uh, we'll try our best to answer it. In the meantime, don't forget to rate us review us and share this podcast so that and all subscribe your friends... hmm? and subscribe oh and subscribe i knew there was one i was missing there's so many things to do i know it's crazy and that way all your friends uh, can listen to and uh, who knows they might even like it uh right is it the time of week for uh, a little interview jamie it is and it's not so little um I, yeah, I, I chatted to David Graham, the lovely David Graham, for quite a while. And as I said at the start of this podcast, unfortunately, there was a technical issue, which means we lost about seven minutes of the interview overall, which I will do my best to fill in from memory. Yeah. Uh, but I covered all sorts of things in David's career, not just Anderson. Um, we tried to cover as much as possible. Uh, and also, as a, as a very happy and healthy 93-year-old, mm. I also asked him for some advice about... Uh, how to maximise one's happiness and longevity. Oh, lovely. Look forward to that. Yeah, but he's a lovely man. I hope you enjoy our little chat with David Graham. Uh, I'll give you a lovely introduction, but if you could... Uh... I'll sum it up in one word. <laughs> <laughs> What's the word? <laughs> Boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, David, not possible. I know, I know people are going to be desperate to hear this sort of stuff, but yeah. if you could give me a little... Uh, I'm David Graham and I have yeah. done these... Anderson related things that would yeah, be great just yeah. a, a little nugget um, I'm David Graham and I, I did a lot of work for the late and great uh, Jerry Anderson who I met on a TV film called Martin Kane and we got talking and he said he was going to try and go into production making children's programs and I said well I'm I'm not bad at accents, and and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. 
And here we are. And so here what, we are. When was that, Mar- Martin Kane? What year was that, do you think? I think it was in the 50s, 1950s. It was a pretty... He said, I remember meeting Jerry on it, and uh, he said, this is not a very good script, David, <laughs> um, but I want you to run like hell across... It was down at Elstree, and I was playing a villain. So I managed to keep, take the curse off it. Uh, to the best of my ability. <laughs> but it was a, a great meeting because from that, a lot of work, long relationship with Jerry ensued, which had a great effect on my career. Well, yes, you, the a sort of unstoppable David Graham, I think you're known as. Well, <laughs> you know, you're, you're born um, with a certain talent, but if you don't have luck and you don't, have that chance meeting with Jerry, perhaps it would never have happened. Perhaps he'd have met someone else and and um, Parker would have had a different voice. But <laughs> Can't imagine you, that, you need You need a, a bit of luck. Um, and then you take the opportunity. I mean, the, most of them, the things I've done, like in the theatre, you know, working in Lance Olivier's company, which was fantastic, was because of a mention. My a friend mentioned me to Michael Blakemore and I did a play for him and then he went to the National, then he asked for me to join, you know. So these things all are cumulative. I don't, I don't think people realise how much of it is based on luck, as much, it, as much as hard work as you put in. Hard work and talent, and you just grab the opportunity, yeah. you know, to do the work you love, you know, because yeah. it wasn't easy... My background, which I won't go into in detail, but I had very great difficulty in shuffling off the mortal coil of orthodoxy and going into the uh, and going into the into the acting profession. In fact, I went to New York because um, my sister was a GI bride, and uh, I managed to go to the neighborhood playhouse to, to get an audition for a man called Sandy Meisner who was quite well-known teacher. And in the class ahead of me was Leslie Nielsen, you know. <laughs> so uh, there were, Gregory Peck was a, before my time, was there. But um, it was okay. I mean, I'm not a method actor. You know, I don't, it's too technical for me. I, I just re- rely on talent and inspiration and technique. Yeah. which you, you gather over the years. Well, but, I mean, all this sort of, you know, I've got to think this through and there's action problems and all this nonsense. You know, but the Americans, the actor's studio, where they all sort of gaze at navels <laughs> no, <laughs> yes. non-stop. It's not, my, it's not my thing. But you've obviously developed that technique and that proficiency over a long time. A long, a long, a long time. You don't consciously do, but the more you work, you know, your discipline and and the stuff you do, you know, when I first started, there was one television channel and um, and, and rep and, you know, in the theatre. And so I honed my technique in the, in the theatre, really. What, why, when, or at what age did you decide you wanted to be an actor? Well, I've always... I've always um, wanted, I always wanted to read the thing at school and be in the school play. But I was, um, I came from a very religious family, so it was frowned on. So I, I, um, when I left the RAF, um, I, uh, I went into an office, which was hell on earth, really. And then I, and then I got away to America, to the neighbourhood playhouse, and then came back, and then it's... Oh dear, this is the bit where our recording equipment failed. I had a lovely chat with David about the great difficulties he had with his parents, and the fact that his mother and father were very much against him going into the arts. Uh, And in fact, the rift that was caused by him doing so was so great that he never reconciled with his father. So there was a great deal of sadness in that bit of the conversation. I'm very sorry it's now lost to the mists of my hard drive. Uh, I then asked David 
about his feelings on first meeting Dad way back in 1955 or whenever it was with Martin Kane. Uh, David just said that, you know, he seemed like a nice bloke. Uh, they kept talking and then came the call for Four Feather Falls. Uh, and that's where we rejoined the interview. And of course, then um, I uh, started off on Four Feather Falls, um, which is one of my favourite actually, although it's primitive in terms well, of sophistication. It, it looks primitive now, but yeah. it was very... I mean, it, actually, the puppetry for the time... It was, it, was, it, was, it was lovely. And as for Gramps, I based it on a famous Western actor called Walter Brennan. Do you remember him? He was in every Western who. in the 30, 40. You know, he talked like that. You know, so uh, I thought he would be perfect. And, of course, Denise was a terribly clever woman. The lovely Denise Breyer. Yes. Yeah, Denise. And uh, and then, who's her husband? You had, you had Nicholas Parsons. N Nicholas. And, he, I mean, I didn't think he was right, you know, for <laughs> the sheriff, but he actually came through. Yeah. You know. No, I loved it. I loved it. And then, and then, of course, I said, well, that's it, you know. You know, I've probably got about six pounds an episode. So, <laughs> uh, I thought I was in Clover. And then, you know, Supercar, and then Fireball, and then Stingray, and then the big one. Yeah. And Jerry kept the faith. In fact, I've got, I'll, I'll show you um, a book. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm showing it to you. Yeah. So, so the Taz biography. Yeah. Which was. <laughs> well, uh, for the benefit of, of the listeners, I'm going to say you've just given me a copy of Dad's biography yeah. and there's a note inscribed in the front for David. Yeah. Thank you for all the voices on so many shows. Yeah. Brilliant. Love, Jerry. Yeah, well. That's a lovely note, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, we used to... I, I can't say I was very ever close with Jerry. We used to meet socially. I remember having lunch with him one day. He was a basically a quiet man, a shy yeah. man. Um, and we went to Soho and had a nice and a nice lunch. But I know the regard he had for me, and it's one of the best things that ever happened to me in the profession. Um, apart from meeting the great Michael Blakemore, director, and who got me into the national working, doing a play with Olivier, you know. I mean, it was just amazing yeah. to be on the stage with a great man. Yeah. Um, when you started on, uh, on Four for the Falls, David, what was what was the process in terms of coming up with voices? Was it just you said, I've got an idea for Gramps yeah. or whatever, and they just, Dad or whoever just said, yeah, run yeah, with it? Yeah, I mean, the, I think we used to go to Birmingham. or I forget the name of the guy who originally did the voice the recordings, but before we went to Slough and it got sophisticated. No, I just came up for with a voice and then Ken Connor and I Pedro and Fernando the, the two gangsters <laughs> and of course all the way through apart from the basic characters I did um, you know um, I used to do a lot of the guest characters like with Ray Barrett on Thunderbirds we, we did we did a lot of guest characters so there was always you know I was always sort of uh, sometimes playing three characters on, on a page and switching. But, you know, I have that facility of doing that. Yeah. Is that fun to do? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> you know, it was a challenge, but uh, we just left a little pause and went into uh, another mood. <laughs> I've, I've seen you doing it and it's, yeah. it's very impressive. Yeah. But what, what do you draw on to find all those voices? Well, I mean, I was, I was, I always had a gift for mimicry. Now that doesn't equate with talent and ability to act, but um, I just have a gift. You know, I hear a voice, and and then I can, and I can imitate it. You know. I mean, you know, I met Roosevelt at Pearl Harbor. He said, you know, 
December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. You know, I just, I have this now. I know it's not the exact, but that's the exact phrasing that Roosevelt had. Yeah. You know, and at school I used to do, we shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them. We shall never surrender. You know, I used to do church. <laughs> I can't do Theresa May, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, shame. You know. <laughs> so, um, did, but, you, did, uh, you do, did you take the mickey out of, you know, doing impressions of school teachers and that sort of thing when you were a kid? Um, no, I was too frightened. <laughs> <laughs> you were too well behaved, of course. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I just love um, being able to zero in on, on a voice. It, it's a gift. It doesn't make you a better actor, you know. Uh, acting is a, a different compartment, but it's a gift which is, you know, it's been so useful to me. Um, you know, I, I, th- I mean, uh, I thank the fates that, that gifted me with a voice. Uh, I yeah. don't thank him up there, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> but it's it's obviously provided pretty well for you. Yeah, over the years. it's been amazing. It's uh, been amazing. Post Four Feather Falls, mm. you thought it was all over. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, Supercar came up. Um, Dr. Beaker. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah. did Dad just come, come straight back to you and said, you know, because of, of all the people on Four Feather Falls, you're the only one to return for yeah. Supercar. You must, you must have had some special treatment or, you you know, were the most impressive of the bunch or something, David? Well, were you the uh, easiest to get along with, um, maybe? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm very easy to get along with because I'm totally committed to the work. And, um, <clears throat> and Jerry obviously saw something in me and my versatility and, um, you know, he kept using me and using me. You know, so I was able to, you know, grow in confidence, you know, and, you know, your, your talent flowers yeah. when you're given an opportunity like yeah. that. Was it, so, was it a supportive atmosphere creatively? Did oh, it oh give yeah, you the, the, the atmospheres were always lovely to work on. Um, you know, I can't, I can't remember a lot of the people, but... Um, you know, later on, Shane and Matt and, and Denise. And, um, but there, so long as the atmosphere is friendly and relaxed, you know, you, you, you can do your work, you know. That's very, very important. I mean, Jerry, you know, would never say, oh, no, that's ridiculous, that's not right. That's not, you know, he just let you expand, you know. He, he he had faith in me, and I had faith in him. It's a nice, a nice little soundbite there. Yeah, a nice relationship to have. So, so you're you get onto supercar. By that stage, is there? Do you get any sense of kind of impending success of these shows? Does it feel like things are getting bigger? Well, I remember Jerry when he went to see Lou Grade and. Uh, and he had this idea for something, and uh, and he said he went into the office. And Lou Gray took a cigar and says, "Make thirteen, make 13. And Jerry went out of the office in a kind of daze, you know. <laughs> and uh, well, Lou Gray, he was a great showman, and mm. he knew a winner when he saw it. Yeah, you know, and um, yeah. And then it went on and on and on till the the amazing uh, Thunderbirds. Yeah. Um, and d- you know, uh, I don't know if Jerry, if I was the first choice for Parker or not. But, but you know, there's this uh, uh, story I've told uh, ad infinitum. <laughs> uh, I don't know the one you mean, yeah, David. Taking me to lunch <laughs> at this uh, pub in Cookham. With the um, with the wine waiter, would you like to see the wine list? Uh, you know, so that was the birth of Parker. Yeah, 
And was it? I mean, you you tweaked him a fair bit from Arthur's Oh yeah, voice. I I sort of with the H's and aspirates and yeah. No, I sort of revved him up. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but but the seed of the voice was there. It was dear Arthur. A lot of stuff was born there. I, um, I think that my mum, Mary, worked mm. at the King's Arms. Oh, really? Yeah, in the early 70s, Was it called these King's Arms? It still yeah. is now, yeah. Okay. Um, is there a plaque up to, to you, me? Do you know there isn't? I can't believe it. I went in there at the end of last year, Yeah. and we said to a kid behind the bar, I say kid, I mean, that, yeah. he was probably, I don't know, 19 or 20, yeah. and we said, have you heard of Thunderbirds? And he went, yeah, I think so. Uh, the puppet thing, and, yeah. yeah, and I, we told him the story about Parker, yeah. and uh, that none of them had any clue, yeah. but he he was sufficiently excited by it. That he came round for, for you know for a photo. Yeah, <laughs> but well, there should a be lot, a plaque there. It's a long time ago. God, no, how long ago is it? Six fifty three years ago. It was it? broadcast. Yeah, yeah, and then recording started and probably 54 yeah at least so yes but still you know it's an iconic character yeah. for an iconic show yeah and the birthplace of his voice is there yeah. so so you were did you see the puppet before you started working on the voice or i think i did see the puppet so you saw this caricature so it was very thing. useful it, you know it, it was i mean you couldn't think of a better face for the voice yeah I mean, it's an unusual face compared to the rest of the boys and the rest of the characters. Yeah, and yeah. Them. They I were mean, more he's... sort of puppety, blandy. Well, well, he's the most caricatured by yeah. far. Yeah. And the most, probably um, the most caricatured voice by far as well. Yeah. But the perfect, perfect foil to Lady P. Yeah. Did you work with Sylvia in terms of developing the characters and the kind of the comedy between them? Was it a natural spark? There was a natural spark, really. I mean, Sylvia, I mean, of course she wasn't an actress, but she just hit the jackpot, mm. really, with that voice. Yeah. I mean, um, it, and um, the comedy was always lovely, especially between Brains and Parker, you know. It was always, they were always scoring points off each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've always loved comedy as an actor. Yeah. Um I mean, I love all, all acting, but I particularly like comedy, which is a question of timing. And uh, I love, I've got a good sense of humour. You know, I'm known for making terrible puns from time to time. <laughs> it's very appropriate. But you were the, really the only major comedy element in Thunderbirds. I know there were sort of other little, especially musical kind of jokey uh, motifs from Barry Gray. Well, I mean, Barry Barry was a genius for my money. I mean, what it, his music was just incredible. Yeah. I've got a picture somewhere. I'll show it to you. Um, a young Barry Gray and me and Denise. Yeah, I'll show it to oh, you. Oh, is that from, from Four for the Falls? Uh, I think the four, there's puppets in the background. Yes, it probably was. Yeah, from Four Feather Falls. I think I've I think I've seen it. No, I see you it. on the on a uh, sort of um, desert set or something like that, or near near one. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. No, Barry was amazing. You know, I mean, the input he had it was it was terrific. Yeah. Well, it transformed those shows, I think. You know, yeah. took, took them just to another. How did another they? Level. I mean, how did he and Jerry contact? It Do you was know what? A I, miracle I, made in heaven. Yeah, though. I think it was just a chance, a chance meeting, mm. a chance doing it's some always music. Always the way, and, isn't it? Yeah, and then, but it was Barry that came up with the idea for Four Feather Falls. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and it was a lovely, charming series. I, I, I'm very soft spot for it. Have you, have you, do you ever watch these episodes of the shows you were in, David? Do you ever rewatch anything for nostalgia's sake? Or do you yeah, ever... sometimes. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I think they should do another series of Four Feather Falls. <laughs> and you should have a character based on Donald Trump. <laughs> a hairy character. <laughs> well, second thoughts, no. No, let's not do that. <laughs> I think we could be into dangerous <laughs> waters yeah. for this. Yeah. Um, uh, but. Barry, in particular, mm. did 
did you meet him much? Did you? I mean, obviously, you know, there's a photo of you, so you must have yeah. been in the same room. But yeah, I didn't meet him a lot, but except in, you know, time to time there was a Christmas party or something. He'd be there. I think he lived. Did he live in the Channel Islands? I think he lived. Uh, yeah, I know he or... drove a Aston Martin or some very <laughs> posh car. I think he loved cars. He must have been doing all right then. I think he. I think you're right, Guernsey maybe or. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because um, I, I just remember him being asked I've, on on tape somewhere. I'll try and insert it in this mm. interview if I can find it. But he he was asked how he came up with the theme for Thunderbirds, and he, I think he was on a train, mm. and it just popped into his head. Yeah, that's it. Moment of inspiration. Isn't that incredible? You need, you need it. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening to a sonata by Mozart, and you know, well, geniuses don't come in much bigger than Wolfgang Amadeus. No, very true. Him and, him and Barry are top two, are they? Yeah. Composers. And Schubert. And Schubert. I, I love, I have, I adore Schubert. Yeah, well, I, heard, I heard you humming when you were went to the door just now was yeah. that were you, were you having the godfather i think yeah theme from the godfather uh, was i yeah, yeah. So got, you well, were... i'm going straight now i, I, I hasten to add <laughs> i put that criminal pass behind me <laughs> i'm glad to hear it with parker yeah of I've course reformed as, with, as parker <laughs> has uh when you were doing thunderbirds in general that that surely must have felt to everybody there like you'd really hit the big time did you get that sense then? Um, well, not quite. Ah. You, you, I mean, you never, you know, actors are very cautious people. Of course. You never think you've made it till you've made it. Uh, but um, there was something about Thunderbirds which was, um, apart from all the other series, as good as they were, it was, it was as if Jerry had been building up to this peak of achievement and Thunderbirds was just amazing really not only t also technically mm. it was just incredible I mean spacewalks and all this sort of thing before and then NASA copied it <laughs> it did yeah. came first well there's so many things now that kind of yeah. were almost invented in shows like Thunderbirds yeah no, they were astonishing. I mean, I mean, Derek Meddings was a genius. Another great man. A genius. He died too young, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Early 2000s, Shocking. Jared, Shocking. I think. Yeah. yeah, very, very sad. Yeah. Um, uh, and what about the, um, the group of people you were working with doing the voices, David? It was... Oh, and Shane and, and Matt and, and Peter Dinely. I mean, that unique voice yeah. I mean it, I mean it just five four three two one I mean they've even got in in the new series yeah because it was definitive absolutely and um, and of course he was taken from us he wasn't even 60 it, it's shocking I mean life's a lottery in so many ways you hope for the best but um, what, what, what can you do you you lead as healthy a life as possible and and what is to be is to be, you know. I mean, I hope I go on a bit longer. Well, you're a re remarkable <laughs> Nick, David. What's yeah. what's your what are your secrets for? This well, I, as I said before, life. no smoking. I don't drink. I gave up meat about forty years ago. Uh, I eat, I eat fish. I exercise. Um, you can only do so much, and then you never know. Um, where the when the Grim Reaper is going to strike? <laughs> it's it's true. It's true. You're also very good at not indulging, aren't you? I've been to a few uh, recordings with you where everybody's snacking on donuts in the afternoon. No, and you're I, very good at saying no, I, thank you. No, I don't. I don't eat um, rich foods at all. You never. Know. No, hardly ever. You know, I don't. I don't. You know, I might. Have a small sherry in the evening, or if I go out to lunch, um, I like, I'll have a Peroni or a glass of wine. But I don't overindulge because I think if you want to go on, 
you know, why abuse your body? I mean, you know, you have to make choices. You know, I enjoy the life, you know, um, and the work. Uh, why compromise it? Well, it's clearly served you very well. Um, post Thunderbirds, can you tell me about work with and without uh, Dad, you know, on Jerry Anderson stuff and away from it? Well, of course, that? parallel to my work with Dad, which was of supreme importance to me, um, I, was, I was doing theatre. I mean, I was in a very famous production many years ago with the great Leonard Rossiter of Arturo Ui, in which he played Hitler. I've never forgot that performance, why it wasn't recorded, why we, we didn't make They made a television production of it and used Nicol Williamson. I mean, he couldn't touch Len's performance. It was a performance of genius, demonic, mm. wonderful. And I played Goebbels. And then that was for Michael Blakemore. I was recommended by a great friend of mine called Chris Benjamin, who's still my great friend. And then... And then Michael Blakemore uh, went to the National Theatre and, and uh, I auditioned for Laurence Olivier and uh, spent two very happy years there doing various plays. The Front Page, which is a great American comedy, um, where I played uh, Diamond Louie, a gangster. You know, it was a lovely part. We toured <laughs> Australia. Um, and then I did uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, uh, and then uh, we that went to the West End, and then uh, a play called Philomena, and then and of course all that time I was doing Doctor Who um, television. I created the Dalek voices with Peter Hawkins and appeared in um, um, the the Gunfight. And then another famous story by Douglas Adams called City of Death, which I played Kerensky. You know, so I've had a very varied career. And then when I left the National, I joined the, the BBC Drama Repertory Company, which I was on it for 18 months because nothing much happened. So that was enjoyable. You know, it played lots of, lots of parts. And then, of course, when ITV came, well, of course... That was because, that was when Jerry and, and, and Lou Grade and all the puppets started, and that that was a, a massive boost for ac for actors. There was so much work, mm. and then I did I did uh, voiceovers and commercials and and stuff. So you know, all in all, it's been a, a, a rich mix. And have you got a preference for screen, theatre, voice work? Well, you know, if I say one, it means I'm pooping on the other. Well, of course. But, I mean, I, 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 I don't do theatre anymore, but I have, a, I have a very strong voice and I can fill a theatre. So, you know, when you've been in productions like with Len, with Arturo Uy and and various other productions at the National Theatre. One will always have a basic love for it. But, um, you know, I mean, television is a totally different technique. You know, it's a more totally real, but um, calm down sort of uh, technique. It's sort of not as, not as energetic. Uh, but um, all in all, it's a television... And uh, uh, screen and voice has been a, a wonderful, if I may put it, creative triumvirate for me, <laughs> for which I, I've indulged and overindulged. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great term, yeah. David Graham's creative triumvirate. Yeah. Lovely. Um, you have voiced and revoiced Parker. Mm over the years yeah. on promo work, on yeah. TV adverts. Yeah, wonderful. It's been a, a nice little payday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you ever get bored of doing him? Never. No. Really? 
uh, somebody, if I got bored with doing Parker, I'd be bored with life. <laughs> yeah. Does that mean that Parker is a particular favourite of yours? Oh, it's a, a great favourite of mine because it's, uh, you know, I managed to create this character and it's been, you know, um, when I say I've done it and if I to a taxi driver, say, oh yeah, yes, my lady. You know, they say, oh yeah, yes, my lady. Um, so, so I do have a great fondness for him. Yeah, sure. And uh, Royal, rightly so. Uh, uh, how how did you feel when you were asked to bring him back for ITV's new Thunderbirds are Go? Well, of, of course, I was I was delighted. You know, um, it wasn't the same format. It was a different format, and I have I have a great fondness for the original series. Um, but um, you know. And it was an opportunity for work, of course. You never turn down work. Uh, you come running, panting. <laughs> Quite right, too. Uh, other, other kind of... If I had to... If I pushed you, David, mm. for your top three Anderson voices that you've done in your career, could you pick them? Well, I would say... Gramps in Four Feather Falls. Really? Okay. And I think I would have thought Parker and Brains. They were favourites. Yeah, I think they were my favourites. And there were lots of others. Of course, you know. of course. Um, but um, I think they were my favourites. You know, as a sudden... Now I've put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah now you've put me on the spot. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but Parker has to be the, the supreme favourite. Yeah. I mean, understandably so. Yeah. Um, Bra- Brains and his stammer. Yeah. It it seemed to reduce during the series and it was almost gone by the end of the the two puppet feature films he did in 66 and yeah. 68. Well, I was, I was always a bit worried that you don't like taking the mickey out of people with speech defects. It was only... I only put it in because Brains was so, he thought so fast that that his mouth, his voice couldn't keep up with it. So that was the justification. Not that I was trying to take the mickey out of it. Of course, of course. You know, so, uh, oh, you noticed it was decreased in effect. It's it's Well, I didn't want to do, you know, I didn't want to bang on too much about it. I just wanted to make it intermittent. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's interesting, isn't it, the balance between um, representation mm. and mocking? Because I'm sh- I'm yeah. sure I don't know. I'm I'm guessing now, but I'm I'm sure that there must have been kids with a stammer mm. or a stutter at, at, at when they were you know yeah. kids watching Thunderbirds, yeah. and they were there was somebody there who was part of this rescue organization organization who was like them. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't feel I like hope, Rangers are mocking. I hope. I hope. That children with a stammer would have accepted it, you know, and, and, and not thought I was taking the Mickey. I, that was the last thing I wanted. To no, do. I don't. I don't think that would ever yeah. cross people's minds. Um, bearing in mind that you've been involved with so many of Dad's shows over such a long time, mm. and the, and now in in ITV's rebirth, of Thunderbirds. Looking back across those years, can you identify any elements that you think are essential to the the ongoing success of those shows? Because there are plenty of shows from that era mm. that aren't rewatched now that don't have the same kind of timeless appeal. Yeah, um, it's difficult. I mean, Thunderbirds had something unique. It had wonderful scripts, wonderful characters, wonderful special effects, um, which were way ahead of their time. I mean, when you think, I don't know, you, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, an episode cost, what, 100,000 quid or, or a very, very expensive. I mean, they're very, I mean, I think it, it's the equivalent now of maybe two, two million pounds an episode. Yeah, I mean, now, it's fan, fantastic. Crazy. 
But look at the quality. Look at oh, the, yeah. Look at the quality, the special effects. I mean, not only the dialogue, the characters, the sets were just amazing. And I think that's why it's had an enduring appeal, and that's why it's, it's had a, a matchless reputation for children's shows, I think, you know. So for you, the visuals are the, the main thing. Yeah. I, th I think also the voices are a major part, you know. Yeah, oh yeah. Because I, I, I listen, well, I watch a fair amount of kids' TV now mm. just, you know, to see what's going on. Mm. And uh, there aren't as many really strong voices around now, I yeah. don't think. That sounds a bit scathing of, of uh, more yeah. voice actors. They're, that's certainly not the true, not true across the board, but there was something about yeah. that era yeah. of the BBC rep and... Uh, actors coming over from the US and Canada. Yeah, I, I I don't know what it is about that vocal quality, but there's yeah something special. Yeah. Uh, you you uh, made a return to an Anderson show recently for me on audio. You came in to do a couple of episodes of Terror Hawks. Yeah, uh, I guess that was a couple of years ago now. Yeah, that's um, right. With Denise. That's right. Who I don't think you'd been behind a microphone with for no a very very long time. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it nice to to do a little bit more Anderson type stuff? Oh, any any time. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I hear the word Anderson, I reach for my coat and hat and come running. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, any any closing bits and pieces you'd like to say, David, in terms of where where people can find you online? You've got a website, right? I have a website, davidgraham.co. That's not com, dot co. And I do get uh, quite a bit of hits. And then I've got a, a bloke, um, David Clough, who is a, actually a teacher, but he, he's a, a, a whiz and he always sends stuff uh, to me. And it's quite touching, you know, when people say how much I meant to them and, you know, uh, in terms of entertainment and voices. So... I always reply to them. Uh, and do you still do you still do conventions, David, or are you avoiding well, those? Well, I don't do as many. I don't want to travel a long way. If something happened in London, yeah, I did a Doctor Who thing recently in outside Oxford, which was okay. But um, you know, I don't. I mean, if you were involved and wanted me to do something, I'd, I obviously would do it. But bless you. But but um, I don't. I used to do. I mean, Shane does a lot. Yeah, Shane and Matt are yeah. always doing the circuit. Yeah. But it's exhausting, isn't it's it? It's exhausting. So, I mean, I'm a new longer young. A <laughs> new longer young. <laughs> so, yeah, well, you've still got a, a youthful energy to you, yeah. David. So. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Oh, Isn't lovely. David lovely? Yeah. That was really sweet. It was so, so great. I should add, though, you know, even the loveliest people aren't always that lovely because I oh. got in yeah. on a on a quite a hot hot day. I was quite parched, and I sat down and he and he said, "Well, I would offer you a cup of tea, but I've got no milk." Oh, so... <laughs> wow! <laughs> and really? that was it. God. So very very Who dry. Who would have thought? David Graham. There. That's a that's a national scandal. That is a scandal, isn't it? <laughs> I was hoping he was going to bring out the big silver Lady Penelope teapot. <laughs> yeah. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. Anyway, it, he was so nice and, yeah. um, you know... Still uh, working. It's Amazing. Still working and still loves it. Yeah. That's the thing. And, it, uh, you know, quite a few times during and after the interview, we started talking about music and all sorts of stuff. And he's just so interested in life. Yeah. In the arts. He... he Absolutely adores music in yeah. particular, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's just so nice to. Was see he into a bit somebody. of drum and bass, a bit of grime? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, in fact, he uh, bizarrely, he's the world's biggest fan of N Dubs, if you remember them. <laughs> Very strange. <laughs> no, I, I, he, he's obviously not. <laughs> but uh, no, he, he, it's just great, and I, I hope that when we are ninety-three, well, uh, which is quite nearby for one of us, yes. Well, exactly. <clears throat> that we are still so full of life and so excited about it because that, I think, is part of the reason why he remains so youthful in so yeah. many ways. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, what yeah. a great chat. Wouldn't Thank you, lovely? David. Yeah, that's great. 
Yeah. Uh, there's lots and lots more uh, in terms of interviews coming. Um, mm. I haven't decided which interview I'm going to play out next week. Oh, so. you're teasing us. Well, I'm not really teasing it. It's just that I've got a few that are really interesting. Yeah. Some are more sort of time appropriate than others. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, do subscribe. Yeah. Otherwise, you, you could miss out on next week's mystery interview. It's yeah. Eight. Yeah, that's great. We did get a, a tweet, actually, from Sarah, who said um, after you had uh, broadcast the, the Gary Newman um, interview in the last pod, she said, my all-time favourite TV shows and all-time favourite musician in the same place. Oh, great. Nice, isn't it? There you go. Well, that's sort of what I was hoping for, yeah. is that there'd be people who love both. That's right. Who, or, you know, people who love Gary stuff and had a, an enjoyment or an awareness of Anderson shows and yeah. get brought in that way. Yeah. Or people who go, who's this Gary Newman bloke? And Absolutely. And they go listen to his stuff and go, oh, he's great. Yeah. Yeah, he is great. Yeah. yeah. We've been very lucky having these lovely people to interview, I think. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. There's so much goodwill out there for, uh, well, not for me, but uh, for, for, <laughs> <laughs> for Jerry and his legacy and, and the, you know, fantastic shows that he made. It's, it's really yeah. nice. Well, long may that continue. Absolutely. So don't forget, you can subscribe, rate and review, uh, and then uh, you'll get to know when each new podcast uh, is uh, published. And uh, do mention us on Twitter, hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Richard N. James, and uh, Jamie is, I'm Jamie Anderson. I'm not going to yes. explain it. I am yeah, Jamie Anderson. you did it, you see? I can't help it now because pe- because yeah, people do go. What well, I am, Jamie Anderson? Yes. No, I'm. It's short the contraction of I am. No, I'm Jamie Anderson. Oh dear, I know. It's, what I'm what fine. a mistake that was. <laughs> yeah, um, no. Anyway, look, it's time for the randomizer. Oh, good. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't have a uh, David Graham character to introduce this, so no. you're stuck with. Yeah. Well, it's me and doing it, or you. Do you want to do it? No, you do it. Right. Well, well, are you going to do? Are you going to do a David Graham character? That's what I'm no. Oh, <laughs> I can't do any voices. No, unfortunately. Yeah. So um, yeah. right. there we go. No, but now it is time for Chris Dale and the Randomizer. This is the voice of the Mister Rose. We know that you can hear us, Earth men. We have observed the popularity of the Jerry Anderson podcast, and we have decided to ruin it for you. We will destroy the randomizer within the next 15 minutes. We will be avenged. Joke's on you, the randomizer's already broken anyway. What the no? Hello, Captain Black, and hello to all of you listening today. Yes, unfortunately, the randomizer has broken down yet again, but it did manage to select an episode for us before it went down. No time for an introduction today because it landed on one of my absolute favourite episodes, our very first non-puppet episode. It's new Captain Scarlet, Grey Skulls. Well, I certainly wasn't expecting to be here quite so soon. This is... Uh, the very last episode of new Captain Scarlet, Grey Skulls, and I've, I just adore this episode right up front, I've got to say that. And I loved this show, I loved it from the first episode. Looking back at it now, much like with Terrorhawks, the first episodes are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. It just built and built, developed and improved, and by the end, it was... I'm looking at this, and it's so far away from the slightly cartoony CGI of the the opening two episodes. And even today, it still it still stands up. I think not the whole series, but certainly some of these last few episodes. There are occasionally glitches and uh, technical goofs, but I can't remember anything in this episode that uh, that isn't an utter joy. I mean, look at this alleyway set, these these barrels. There, the, there they go. Um, this, the street set, these buildings, the texture on the clothes. It may be that I'm watching this on uh, Blu-ray and that's giving it a boost, but uh, I think it's, it's uh, an episode that really showcases the talents of the team that were working on this show. Oh, there goes Brock's bike. You just know that Captain Blue was driving that day. Any, any wanton unnecessary destruction of public property that's always Captain Blue 
which I kind of like. I do enjoy the uh, bull in a china shop characterization of the new Captain Blue. I can never understand how Oka doesn't actually see Colt when she when she arrives outside the warehouse. She looks directly at him. She can see that the uh, rhino doors are wide open, and she still just takes off. I would probably put that down to a, an animation goof rather than a, an error on her part, because I love Captain Oka. I don't think she would make that error. She's made enough mistakes in this episode already by leaving her motorbike unlocked. Three weeks we've been on the trail of those stolen alien spores. I should really uh, address the main issue, well not issue, uh, highlight of this episode, which is the starring role given to Captain Oka. Now in the original series, I, <laughs> as a kid watching Captain Scarlet on the BBC, Captain Oka was my favourite character, and even at the time I couldn't tell you why, because he very rarely did anything. Uh, he got smashed on Mr. and I's champagne and accidentally blew up a naval base. That seemed to be about the highlight of his contribution to the show. So when when the CGI show started and there was all this talk of Lieutenant Green is going to be a woman now, and there was a rumour that Captain Oka would also also switch genders, but she didn't appear until I think the the 13th episode. The show in the first half seems to almost completely forget that there were other captains besides Scarlet and Blue. I think there are even some episodes in that first half where even Blue doesn't appear. And it it's always seemed a bit of a shame, even though the show is called Captain Scarlet, that the focus was always solely on him. You look at the original series, what do Oka, Grey and Magenta do all day? Um, obviously, we know Magenta is uh, is getting into all sorts of uh, mischief and shenanigans, knocking himself out with doors and things. But uh, what are the others actually doing? These are all qualified, talented people, all experts in their chosen fields, and they're just kind of left behind while Scarlet and Blue are kicked off yet again to to save the day. Whereas in the new show, I think Captain Oka is hugely important to this show, even though she arrived very late on, uh, even though. Obviously, we have the Angels, who had some stories, some focus on them. Even though we have Lieutenant Green as a woman now, who had some focus and some stories on her. It's so important that she is a captain, that we have a woman out there in the field with the boys, the equal of the boys. She doesn't need to defer to them. She is, as we see in this episode, she is thoroughly capable of handling a mission on her own. And I love what Julia Brahms brought to this character. I love the slightly sardonic... The Irish uh, tone is a lovely touch. But... She is just such a nice character. And it's it's amazing to, to think the final episode of the show, it's just the Captain Oka show. It's like, you know, forget those other guys. We've got a woman here who can just get the job done who can kick some Mr. on butt, and, uh, and it's just fabulous. And this scene is just a perfect summing up of the character. What do you know? A spaceship really did crash here. Which world did you come from? Planet stupid or planet ugly? OK, it's a terrible line. It's an absolutely terrible line. She probably knows that it's terrible because just she was looking for this fight and she's got it and she is enjoying every second of it. And so are we. The shot of her kicking the guy through the window is so cool. I apologise if I'm coming off like a uh, a uh, squeeing fanboy, but uh, if there was a Captain Oka fan club, oh boy, I would be like the the first one to sign up. I absolutely love this uh, this music, by the way. This. Uh, Crispin Merrill piece here, which is uh, thankfully on the soundtrack CD that was released not too long ago. It's one of the absolute highlights of that. Now here we have an interesting situation because uh, Oka has now tracked down Colt, who has uh, stolen her raid bike. And Colonel White was very cross, said she had to get it back at all costs. Um, she is now driven out there in her little cheetah car. And um, given that the Colonel was so angry with her for losing the bike, it's amazing that she is now about to lose the car and he doesn't question it. Oh, but I love that shot, though. That is a glorious explosion. The The explosions in the CGI show were not always 100% convincing, but that one is really good. And what sells it is the way that Oka instantly throws herself to the floor, and then she's back up almost as soon as she's landed. Neptune. 
If only we had some idea where Rimmer plans on setting off that bug bomb. So what do we? I know? suppose the only downside to this episode is the scarlet and blue roll. Um, it's just kind of filler because we kind of know they're on the wrong track. Um, in our atmosphere for a few minutes. And in any other episode, they would be on the right track because they would be the only characters in the story. But however, this is Oka's story now. These two are kind of superfluous in that sense, um, particularly in the case of the finale where neither of them get the job done. It's all down to her. Now, I should probably address uh, an issue that some people have with this show, um, with Captain Oka and especially with Lieutenant Green, the fact that they were men in the original series and they are now women in the the new show. My feeling on that is... It's brilliant. It's fine. What what the hell is the problem? Um, just because... It's much like with the, the idea of a female doctor. Just because something's never been done before, just because something's always been a certain way, it doesn't mean that there's necessarily anything wrong with trying it different. And... I think in both cases, certainly in this show, it paid off. Green and especially Oka are such good characters. And, you know, if you want another another male captain, there's Grey, there's Magenta, there's even Brown and Indigo. None of them ever do anything in this show. Um, and it's not... I mean, maybe it is for, from a certain extent... They've given Oka more to do because she's a woman, because they're trying to appeal to a, to female viewers. I would like to think that the gender side of it is irrelevant to the fact that she is just a really good character being brought to life by a really good actress. Um, so, yeah, anyone who says, like, oh, I don't watch the show because Lieutenant Green is a man, it's like, kind of missing the point there. So this episode was the, the very last episode of the show to be produced. The plan was that uh, the final two episodes to be produced were going to be House of Dolls, which was scrapped because it was deemed too scary for kids, and then Dominion, which was the final episode. So once House of Dolls was scrapped, they began work on Dominion, and this episode was produced as a replacement penultimate episode, but was made last. Uh, unfortunately... Nobody at ITV realised that, and so it was shown after Dominion, and it was released on DVD after Dominion. I... I do tend to look at this one as the final episode, in spite of the fact that I know in my heart Dominion is meant to be the final episode. You can see there is so much work going into this, there is so much effort, even though the show always had... Um, a lot of energy being put into it, a lot of effort being shown right up there on screen. You can see it in this episode. This is like a showcase. If I, were, if I was going to show somebody an episode to make them realise how good this show was, this would have to be it. Which is why, in a way, I'm kind of dis disappointed that we reached this one first, because uh, I, oh, I love this one, and I just wanted to kind of hold it back to, uh, to do a few more episodes first before we got to this, but... This is a gem. And I think right now, Spectrum's looking for the wrong man. And I do love the relationship between uh, Colt and, and Oka here. You can see the expression in her eyes and in his eyes. There's this underlying trust, even though they're technically on opposite sides. They both know they're fighting for the same thing, and they are really, they are really on board with each other. If there had been a second series of this show, which they absolutely should have been, I would have loved to have seen this episode being been returned to I would love to have seen Oka and Colt team up again they are such a good team and this theme park is another wonderful setting not least because there are so many characters milling around in the background we usually the extras in New Captain Scarlet were kind of uh, non-existent I mean aside from the officers Skybase is populated by like one bald guy and his several hundred identical clones actually working the desk here at the theme park we have a uh, a monkey-faced man who appeared as a technician in um, Swarm. I think he was killed in Swarm and uh, reappeared several times through the series. It's probably the only time the show really produced a background character who you would actually notice, because otherwise they are just generic clones. This guy's got a slightly dopey, elongated face that uh, that always kind of drew you to him. Okay, going through the, uh, the theme park here, this race through the theme park, you are seeing several characters just completely oblivious to the fact that they're about to get run over but there are probably more extras in this one scene 
than we've seen in like the entire rest of the series put together. Uh, even though some of them, if you look closely, don't appear to have faces. Um, we're not looking at them, we're looking at the action in front. It is a bit contrived here how uh, how Blue is knocked out, how Scarlet, despite you know heroically leaping to the rescue like he always does in both versions because he's indestructible, Scarlet utterly stuffs this up and it's down to Ochre to save the day. Um, it makes a nice change from the usual uh, Scarlet heroics to have somebody else who can do the job for a change. Is that guy nuts? No, indestructible. I just noticed that behind Ochre there in that shot, there is somebody wearing a new Captain Scarlet t-shirt. Uh, it's got the, the show's logo on the back. I have never noticed that before. And it's not like it's particularly hidden in the background. That is right there. Oh, I love this show. And that's the end of, uh, of Scarlet and Blue in this series. In fact, everybody is just gone by the end of this show in order to hand the last few minutes over to uh, the conclusion of the Captain Ochre show, which is just, it's fine with me. I would gladly watch the Captain Oka show. Hit this rhino with everything you've got. And I do love that she only just gets out in, in time. Because it's, it's again, with Captain Scarlet being indestructible, oh, OK, he's the master of last-minute escapes in this show. The other characters don't get to risk their lives as much. But just because that never happens doesn't mean they're not as brave as him. And in this case, we do get to see that. She's just saved the world with the help of her biker friend. Now, whenever I'm re-watching New Captain Scarlet, um, which is fairly regularly, I always put this episode last, despite the fact that it obviously takes place before Dominion, because of the fact that it was the last episode that Jerry Anderson worked on. It's the very last TV episode with his name attached. So it's not so much a wonderful end to a fantastic show. It's a wonderful end to an entire 50-year span of, of Jerry producing television shows. I don't think Dominion is necessarily a particularly strong episode to go out on, whereas this is his show and his ideas and his team firing on all cylinders. And the image of, uh, of the bikers driving away and Oka sat there watching him go. You can imagine she's kind of wondering what the future might have been if she'd... Uh, if she'd perhaps gone with him. Meantime, we'll be looking out for Mr. Ants. Yeah. Well, that was as perfect as I remember it. That episode has never disappointed me. I can't imagine it ever will. Much like most of New Captain Scarlet, uh, particularly in the, the later episodes, it's just a joy to watch. There is very little here that I can and not like. And Captain Oka, God bless her and God bless Julia Brahms for producing such a fantastic creation. Anybody who's got an issue with gender swapping characters, this is the episode to show them goodbye. Well, thank you, Chris. Have you seen much new Captain Scarlet, Richard? I, do you know, I remember seeing it back in the day, uh, not very much of it, and I'm afraid to say I haven't seen it since. Now, I do know of it because, of course, Wayne Forrester provided... Uh, the voice of, uh, of Captain Scarlet, and he indeed was on Space Precinct. So another actor that, that, that Jerry um, Jerry used again. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. Wayne is coming up in a future podcast as lovely. well. Lovely. He's, he's done a lovely interview. Great. Um, we got a bit... In fact, when Wayne does come up, we got a bit deep, actually, and we, oh. had, to, we had to pause the recording for, for a few tears. What? I know. It what? was... It was an amazing Are you chat able we had to provide a bit of context, or do we just? Have well, to wait? I think I think we just kind of got into the relationship with our dads and the influence mm. they have over us and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, and and it was it got a, it didn't get heavy, but it no, got no. emotional, yeah. which is amazing. And again, amazing the power of Anderson shows. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so yes, no. But uh, Wayne was a great part of New Captain Scarlet. And Richard, I'm going to send you a copy of the Blu-ray. Oh yeah, so that you can enjoy it at yeah. home. Oh, well, that'd be lovely, yeah. And then I'll be able to actually know what I'm talking about. Exactly. For once. Yeah. Anyway, thanks, Chris. I'm so glad you got a new Captain Scarlet episode, because I know you're such a massive fan. Yes. If you want to know what uh, episode Chris will be forced to listen to and, and watch and comment on next week, then uh, do subscribe to our podcast and uh, tune in uh, for Pod 8 and see what he's presented with then. Yeah, Pod 8 next week. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, now you'll probably want to scuttle off and grab yourself a limited edition Captain Scarlet Blu-ray box set, Volume Four, yeah. uh, and or the Captain Scarlet pistol, all also uh, highly limited. 
available at the Jerry Anderson store, shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. And yeah. you can also get 40% off posters with the code FABWALLS at Amazing. checkout. Amazing. All that there good, we go. It's good oh. stuff, isn't it? That's lovely. Yeah, and please do get in touch for the next podcast on uh, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk with your comments, questions, thoughts. Keep tweeting us because we love to uh, hear from you and I'll read out a few tweets next time as well. Yeah, the tweets are great. Yeah, aren't they? Thank you. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Uh, so until pod eight, yeah. we should probably go and get on with our jobs. We should really, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, go and earn a living. Yeah. Yeah, all, right. all right. Let's do that. See you next time. Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. For listeners' e- emails, David, there is something magical when you do those voices. <laughs> it's it's so, it's so strange how time. Flattery will get you nowhere. Uh, well, I'm not. It's I'm, <laughs> I'm only saying it because I really, I really I kind of feel it. You know, it, yeah. it, I, it, well, it just gives me such great joy doing it. You you mm. instantly kind of see the puppet in your mind's eye. Even, yeah. even though I'm looking at you, I can kind of. Yeah, see see the puppet at the same time. It's 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 so yeah. bizarre to have voices that are so strong. Yeah, well, oh, thank that you. They conjure the characters up so beautifully. Yeah, that's lovely. It's really really nice. Uh, I feel like I should I should try and get some water now, but I don't.